talking about uh, a couple of papers really having to do with documents and uh, data mining and, and kind of discovering new things. We have uh, with us Jonathan Stray, who was a senior computer scientist at Adobe, then interactive editor at the Associated Press, and most recently is a research scholar at Columbia. It was while Jonathan was at the AP that I think he developed Overview, and I've actually used Overview a lot in my time at the Seattle Times, so I'm interested to hear what he has found uh, in his paper and talk about that. And then we have Titus Plattner, who is an investigative reporter with Tamedia in uh, Switzerland. And he'll be talking about uh, a new kind of tool slash platform that they're developing there uh, called Tadam. And I have to tell you that every time I say that word, I think about uh, Captain Marvel, which is a 1960s, you know, you know, it's like, it's like Shazam, it's gonna solve all of our problems. <laughs> and so I kind of feel like that's what you're trying to do is solve all of the problems of, of journalists in terms of dealing with this fire hose of, of documents and data. So I'm um, interested to hear how that's going to work. So we'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, Jonathan will talk and then Titus will talk. I'll, I'll ask a couple of questions and then we'll open it up for some more discussion. Hi, so my name is Jonathan Stray and um, by a, a, a strange not so coincidence, um, you've already heard about a bunch of my, my work on this thing called Overview. Um, I'm gonna step back from that a little bit though and I'm going to try to present the lessons I've learned about trying to apply natural language processing to journalism. Um, and my hope is to motivate uh, computer scientists to not only work on the problems of journalists, but to work on the right problems. And um, I speak from bitter experience. Uh, in fact, this is a little bit of a rant, but I'm not really ranting at you, I'm ranting at myself six years ago when I started this whole process. So this was a paper, um, in fact, two of the authors uh, of this paper are in the audience today, uh, that really inspired me uh, when I was at the AP in, um, in 2011. Stories will emerge from stacks of financial disclosure forms, etc. Emerge, huh? Um, <laughs> so this was a great paper, but uh, it didn't go into a lot of detail about what it was that journalists actually do. What is the, the process of turning these types of records into stories? And that's what I'm going to try to um, get to today. So um, I'm not going to present the paper really, there's lots of fun stuff in there. I, I just tweeted the link to that. Um, what I'm gonna try to, to show you is, is sort of the lessons learned and the directions that I hope we can go in. Um, so the paper is two things. It's um, an analysis of uh, every story completed with overview to date, at least the set of those for which I have good information on what the journalists were actually doing. I was able to talk with the, the reporters. Um, and then it's an analysis of every case that I know of where natural language processing techniques were applied in journalism, uh, of which there are five, which seems like a small number. That should be a bigger number. So overview, you've seen a little bit. Um, it has a bunch of different uh, tools. It does clustering, it does entity detection, it does word clouds, it does various types of searches. Um, the, the fun part is this table. So this is uh, my attempt at like a one slide summary of, of what I know about what journalists do, at least with this tool. Um, some things to look at here. About half of the documents arrived on paper. Um, we're gonna talk about that a lot. Um, uh, paper is still an extraordinarily common medium and if it's not paper, it's a PDF of scans and there's, there's various reasons for that. Um, the median document set size is about 4,000 documents, um, but the largest here is 123,000, and there's other projects where it's gone up to hundreds of thousands or, or millions. Um, and uh, uh, emails are quite common, and about uh, a little more than, than half the time in this set, the journalist already knew what they were looking for. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a lot more detail. Um, but rather than belabor the point, uh, you know, this, this table, I'm gonna talk about what I wish we had, what I hope natural language processing research, uh, researchers will, will help journalists out with. So, robust import. 
A document is not a string of characters. Repeat after me, natural language processing folks. A document is not a string of characters. It's this, it's this word that covers a multitude of sins. Um, so here are some documents from a story I worked on. These were um, records of every time a private security contractor working for the US Department of State uh, fired a weapon during the Iraq war. This was from a FOIA request um, by John Cook. Uh, this came to 4,500 pages, which is, you know, about so, arrived on paper. And there's just tremendous variation um, in the documents. There's lots of different types. Um, the documents have holes punched in them. They have hand annotations. They're these complicated forms. They're redacted. Um, they're kind of a mess, and this is pretty typical. Uh, or you might see this. Uh, you might get a deep uh, directory structure full of all kinds of different files. Um, so this is um, actually, this is a very well organized one because the reporter has organized this. Um, but if you get like a leaked hard drive full of, of information, which is how the Panama Papers came about, this is what you're dealing with. Um, Overview reads about a dozen file formats. By comparison, commercial e-discovery tools read several hundred. And you know, even something like PDF, which you think is standard, is not. Um, you get password protected PDF, you get PDF, which is almost but not really standards compliant. Um, you get very old versions of documents because documents stay around for a long time. And you know, I kind of wonder if, um, you know, nobody likes to write parsers, um, but maybe we can do better than just sort of like hacking on, on you know, 20 year old C code um, to read 20 year old Word documents. Maybe we could do some deep learning on file formats to try to uh, have more robust import of documents that are corrupted or don't quite follow the standard or are some weird ass format and um, you know, maybe we can still get the text out of them. Um, emails, this is an email uh, to a journalist. An email is uh, not a mail spool file, it is not structured information. Um, uh, about um, half of the um, stories that were done based on email, the email arrived on paper, uh, which means that uh, metadata reconstruction from scanned email is a major unsolved workflow problem. I don't think there's anything in principle uh, intractable about this problem, it's just that nobody's done it. Um, and to remind you the importance of this problem, I wore my, my favorite shirt. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, it's my favorite heavy meta band, <laughs> right? Um, so it turns out that, you know, uh, you know, Overview does all of this spiffy analysis stuff, but the most useful, the most um, requested, and the most expensive feature to implement was this one, add files. Um, there's an insane amount of engineering that goes into this button, and it's still not good enough. Um, there's a general point here, which is that if you actually talk to people who do data work on a regular basis, uh, and not just journalism in any field, you find that most of the work is uh, import, cleanup, wrangling, ETL, whatever you want to call it, that's what actually takes the time. The analysis is relatively fast. Um, and this is one of a, a, a small number of papers that point out that um, researchers are just not looking at this, which is funny because that's where the big wins are in terms of speed ups. Uh, theme number two. Uh, closely related, robust analysis. Um, so when I read the NLP research uh, re literature and I look at what people are working with, it's uh, news articles, which gives me a, a laugh because um, that's researchers looking at the output of journalists, right? So the, the news article is what happens when the journalist has taken this incredibly messy input data and turned it into something incredibly clean. Um, or people like to categorize scientific papers or there's test data sets. Uh, as I've been illustrating, that's not what journalists have. Um, and so when I read NLP research, I just look at it and go, ah, you guys are so lucky. Um, so again, here's, here's some, some more real data. Uh, this is from the same um, Iraq contractor stuff. Um, and here's the OCR on the right. Um, if you look closely, you'll see that not only is there all kinds of uh, you know, spelling errors, but actually, 
the redaction has confused the OCR and whole phrases are in the wrong place. So you miss words and then they get scrambled. You know, and that's on a good day. Um, so uh, this makes typical search-based techniques uh, fall apart. Uh, parsers as well. Um, and then, of course, they're not even in English. So this is from a story that you saw yesterday about the, um, the Los Angeles Times showed that the Los Angeles police had uh, misstated the seriousness of uh, tens of thousands of crime reports. And they did this by analyzing them first by hand and then uh, using that as a training set for a machine learning classifier. Um, not really English. So parsers break, dictionaries break. Now, in principle, these problems should be solvable because if you have enough data, um, you can probably infer the meaning of the words that you can't figure out, right? So we, we know how to do spell checking, we know how to do like, you know, propagating labels for inference and these types of techniques. Um, uh, it's never really been, been done in journalism. And even very standard algorithms are not well tuned. So this is from tests that my students have done over the years. Um, relatively clean data, that is to say, news articles. Uh, just testing entity recognition, uh, Open Calais, which is a, a Reuters named entity recognizer. Um, and it has some really predictable failure patterns. So it's very bad with um, companies outside of the US. It's very sort of US centric. And this is something I see all the time. Uh, journalism is global. There's an enormous amount of transnational work. Um, I work with news organizations like the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. They deal with documents in 18 languages. Um, uh, you know, standard, standard NER just falls apart on this stuff. Also, uh, named entity recognition tends to be tuned to balance precision and recall. That is not what you need for journalism. You need high recall. You get as much precision as you can, but you need the recall because you don't want to miss something, and the journalist can weed out the junk. Search, not exploration. Um, this is what I wished I, I you know, had told myself um, years ago when I started an overview. The motiv motivating problem, as you heard, was I was reporting on uh, WikiLeaks. Um, but it turns out WikiLeaks is, is not a normal example. That is a huge, unanticipated document dump. Most of the time, journalists ask for documents for a reason. There's something they're trying to find. Um, and so this was um, actually one of the papers that um, I co-authored with Tamara, um, where I had this little snarky piece of language um, saying that you know, most of the NLP and visualization literature that deals with text, they talk about exploring the document set. We're going to explore the corpus of scientific papers. We're going to explore the, you know, the, the, the news articles. Um, by and large, people in journalism are not paid to explore document sets. They're paid to produce stories, um, which means that this word explore, most of the papers which use this word have never actually tested it with real users and real user data. So it's, it's a way of hiding the fact that we don't know why we want the visualization. So search is really important. Um, overview is 60-40 you know, search exploration, the cases that I've listed. But it is also an exploration tool. And I would say, in terms of the breakdown of tasks that journalists have, it's, it's more like 80-20 or maybe 90-10. But just because it's search doesn't mean it's easy. Doesn't mean it's solved with Lucene. So here's a search problem. Um, there's a complicated backstory, but basically there was a, a dispute between the, the union and the city, and uh, a body was left on the sidewalk overnight because nobody was, uh, the coroner wasn't on call. So um, Adam Playford, uh, then at Newsday as part of a, a Pulitzer finalist story, um, wanted to see if this was ever mentioned by the uh, county legislature. And it was. He read through 7,000 pages to find this reference. You notice nowhere in there does it say, uh, body, or union, or sidewalk, or any of these things. Um, now, in principle, this is a solvable problem, right? We know how to do um, you know, uh, time references in text. We know how to do paraphrasing. Um, we, we know, you know we, this, this sort of thing seems like it should be solvable, and we should have much more powerful search tools than we do. Also, um, sometimes you want a visualization for search. So uh, you heard about the, this case where the reporter was trying to prove that a document set did not contain something. And they used overviews clustering to help organize their search to make sure that something wasn't there. 
Um, so search isn't Lucene. Search is this very complicated problem. And the most complicated example of that is corruption. We are searching for corruption in a document set. Well, how do you, how do you define that as a search target? So journalists are usually searching, but the things they're searching for are very complicated. Quantitative summaries. There is a long tradition uh, in journalism of counting documents, counting documents of a certain type to produce a story. Um, so here's one example. Here is um, a, a, a somewhat horrific document set that I dealt with um, at ProPublica a couple years ago. These are incidents at a, a um, group home uh, for children. And the reporter's question was, um, let's break down the incident types by date. Uh, so this is what the thing looks like, and that's what we're trying to, trying to count. And of course, you OCR it, and it falls apart, and there's typos. And sometimes the incident report spans multiple pages, which messes up simple algorithms. And I eventually wrote this custom parser that was like um, fuzzy regular expressions to capture the dates, and then um, uh, Levenstein distance, edit distance, to map to a hand-built set of incident type categories. And this stuff happens all the time. There's some crazy data extraction problem from some crazy data set, but really you just want to count. Uh, and you find quite a lot of stories that report this. This is the LEPD crime mass misclassification story, right? Um, you know, 20,000 hand-labeled incidents, uh, 400,000 uh, items to, to label, um, but really all they wanted was numbers. Um, this is a case of a very complicated counting problem. This was uh, another Pulitzer-nominated story. Um, uh, Reuters analyzed 5,000-ish messages from a Yahoo message board uh, where people were trading children. This was like um, being generous, uh, underground adoption. Um, but to do this, they had to trace the biography of each child, uh, which meant like reading through email threads and email spaced over many years um, sometimes these kids were traded from, from um, you know, home to home um, to see that they were talking about the same person. A very complicated analysis, text analysis task, uh, which really in the end boils down to counting something, but counting something very tricky. Next, interactive methods. Uh, as you heard this morning, there is a human in the loop. In fact, um, I was, um, uh, you know, we wore the same dress to the ball. Um, uh, I love this chart. Um, this, this chart, which I've, I've relabeled a little bit um, from design study methodology to interactive techniques, explains why um, we should not be going for automated techniques. It, it is very unlikely that um, uh, we will solve the problems that I've been describing in automated fashion uh, in the near future, even in the distant future, because the things that journalists do are not clear. The process of producing a story is this very um, very contextual, very iterative task of, of defining what is the story. Um, and also, the information that you need to do it is not in the documents. Um, very often, key information is in the reporter's head. My favorite example of this is a Wall Street Journal story um, uh, about um, the CEO of EMC Corporation flying their corporate jet to their vacation home. So they did this by analysis of FAA records, um, but the FAA records don't tell you, A, where the vacation homes are, and B, that they're not supposed to be flying their jet there. So the data you need to produce the story is not in the document set. Uh, and so interactive techniques will be critical for the foreseeable future. Also, um, this is uh, work from um, one of my students um, who analyzed the, the speed and accuracy of extracting data from a document set uh, in various ways. And what she was trying to do was get bounds on four different types of data. You know, do you want something simple like um, was there a conviction in this case, or do you want something complicated like did a company in initiate the investigation? Um, and four different document set sizes. You know, is it 100, is it 1,000, is it 100,000? What is the best technique? Is it worth trying to code up a classifier? Should you use a classifier plus human correction, which is a very common and popular technique? Or should you just sit there and annotate it? Or should you farm it out to Mechanical Turk? We don't have very good bounds on this. Finally, clarity and accuracy. Now, this is a problem that appears a lot in the machine learning literature. Um, we need to know what the algorithms do. Um, we need to be able to interpret the models. This applies triple in journalism. 
Uh, here's a, I, the only story to my knowledge that uses topic modeling in journalism um, about the um, types of cases uh, that uh, were represented by uh, elite lawyers arguing before the Supreme Court, right? So we're looking at, you know, um, you know, how often do these lawyers represent business interests versus individuals? Um, and so this is what they did. Uh, and so they used topic modeling. And uh, so then, you know, let's ask the question, well, how do you know that the topic modeling was correct and that these numbers are accurate? Well, of course, there's a very simple answer to this in the topic modeling literature. Um, what you do is you compute the posterior probability of observing the documents that you actually had given the uh, model that you built based on the training data, right? That's like, that's straightforward. We can explain that to our readers. Um, so we're gonna need to do better than that. And there is a small strand of literature um, which talks about this. This is a very nice paper uh, which highlights these two aspects that a visualization should have. Interpretation, we need to be able to know what it says. Trust, we need to be able to know what it's right. And this goes triple in journalism because not only does the journalist have to know uh, what the model is saying and that it is correct, they have to explain it to the readers. Journalists are accountable to the readers for their conclusions, which means it's not enough to be right. You have to be able to say why you're right to people who have no idea how any of this works. Uh, for this reason, rather late in the game, we added some relatively straightforward visualizations to overview. Uh, word clouds are much maligned. I have engaged in some word cloud bashing myself. But the thing about word clouds is everybody knows how to interpret a word cloud. So actually what we have is we have an editable word cloud. You can, you can delete words that you're not interested in looking at. And as you delete the words, um, other words fill up the space. So it's actually um, a, a instantly interpretable and, and quite useful um, exploration tool. Um, and then just basic um, searches. Um, this is this thing called multi-search. You just look at a bunch of different terms and you can take their intersections and stuff and you can you know, paste terms in. It seems like really boring from an algorithmic perspective, but it's extremely useful because if you're trying to figure out how many documents talk about a particular topic, rather than wondering if your clustering algorithm got them all, you have um, a very straightforward sense of the error modes of your analysis. You know, if there's a synonym that you didn't include in your search, you know that there's a synonym that you didn't include in your search. So um, those, those are my, my uh, plea for, for research help from the NLP community. Um, uh, other than those research directions, I think we need two other things that I've, I've been working on. Um, dirty document corpora. I, I suspect that trigram has never existed before. I'm proud of that. Um, there's lots of NLP training and test data sets. Um, there are essentially none that are of relevance to journalism because they're all too clean. The good news is, is that there's lots of data sets that journalists have used that are now public. Um, I've been trying to collect a few of these. They, I, you know, they need a home, so if you want to host um, horrifying uh, document sets for NLP researchers, talk to me. And the other one is a shared development platform. Um, you know, all of this code that uh, we write both in the CS and journalism communities doesn't really add up to anything. It never makes it to production, um, which makes me very sad. So uh, Overview supports plugins. Um, you can try your spiffy new technique in an interactive loop and you don't have to worry about OCR and search and all that stuff because Overview will do it for you. Uh, and in fact, I've just started a new gig at Columbia uh, where I'm going to be building a, a thing called Journalist Workbench, which will be uh, an interactive data analysis platform for journalism. So all open. Now, you don't have to love these projects, but um, I do think that we need to start thinking about some platform somewhere where uh, all of our work can uh, cross the boundary from research to production and hopefully add up to more than the fragments that we have now. All right, thank you. Now we'll, now we'll have Titus. So, uh, yesterday you, you, you've met uh, Mans, the Swede, and I'm the Swiss, so that's the difference. <laughs> so I, I will present you uh, our uh, tool uh, at Tamedia, Tamedia Data Mining, uh, 
basically, um, it's meant to be a, a Swiss knife for journalists uh, who have to deal with a huge amounts of uh, unstructured data. It's about, it combines different capabilities like uh, data scrapping, uh, multi-language translation, uh, and entity extraction. But more concretely, uh, it's just storing, searching, and most important, collaborate. I am a reporter, so what matters to me is not to build uh, an amazing tool, but just doing a better journalism. I collaborated um, with uh, the ICIJ since uh, Offshore Leaks, um, and uh, with Offshore Leaks we had this, this truck. So we needed a tool to search the document in it. And three years later, we had 10 trucks. And there are many, many, many trucks that are coming to us, and we have, we have to find a way to deal with this. Even on a more uh, local level, there are big uh, sets of data that are handled to journalists. In Switzerland, we had, for example, the Swisscom tapes, uh, all the emails, internal emails of the uh, Swiss national uh, telecommunication company, or uh, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan files that were related to Swiss officials. Our uh, company uh, wants to, um, to play a leading role in the investigative field, so uh, the company decided that it has to have the capability to deal with this kind of material. But even on a daily uh, basis, uh, this is useful. When I started doing journalism in 1996, 20 years ago, one of my tasks was to just to monitor the fax room for the older colleagues and bring them the five to 10 pages uh, to, for their reporting. Today, journalists are dealing daily with hundreds of pages of documents. It's too much, you can't read it, all, of it, of, of, all of them. But the reality in the newsroom hasn't changed. This is a true image. So we need a tool. In our company, we have newspapers that are playing a, a role on the national level. We have regional newspapers and we have magazines economic magazines, women's magazines, etc. And Switzerland is also a kind of a special country with uh, four uh, languages. So we speak uh, Italian, Romansh, French, and German. We, we just kept the, the two most important, French and German, and because we are pragmatic, we added English. <laughs> So what we do you have today? We have built a, a software, and that's probably the most important slide, uh, that is able to uh, eat every kind of uh, file format and also to grab things from emails directly or directly from the internet. The tool is web-based, so you can access to it even through your handheld. If you need it, and it uh, looks like this. So on the top, in the middle, you have a, a search field. In the center, you have your search results. On the left side, you have your extracted entities. And on the right side, you can restrain your search to a certain corpus of documents, etc. The tool allows you to do some complex uh, queries with Boolean operators. You can visualize it in word clouds. You can explore your content on a map. You can see connections between entities in your search result. You have a um, very quick document summary and you can
quickly preview your document. Uh, the ICIJ, with only two or three uh, developers, did an amazing work, really incredible. But one thing I missed was just this. Uh, we had to download every document to, 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 to decide if it's important or not to go further. So uh, that's why I wanted absolutely uh, just this, this feature. Click and preview quickly the document. You have your uh, document detail and the entities are highlighted. You can search in the index. You have uh, your entities and so it, the system recognizes places, cities, people names, companies, etc., etc. And everything that comes in is translated into three working languages, English, French, and German, and can come from over 60 languages. So for example, you have uh, Spanish, and on, you can select your tab and have it in English. It works also for Chinese, it works for Arabic, for example. And the cool thing is that you have the entities then who are recognized. So you can see, even if you don't speak Arabic, you can see if it's important or not for you. The system uh, is able to eat more than 50 file formats. And when you pour in uh, a set of uh, thousands of emails, this is a real example from the Panama Papers, you have emails containing other emails containing documents, documents that have to be OCR'd. So the system does it uh, by, uh, automatically. In fact, the, the, the Swiss knife is an Italian knife because our, our software uh, supplier is an Italian company, uh, Expert System. They were active in um, uh, in other markets like insurance industry, banking industry, uh, they provide software for state agencies, but they never have done this kind of work for uh, news organizations. So we had to adapt the tool. We worked in small teams. We did many, many, many iterations. We learned a lot. And we are, after one year, ready to deploy the system. By the way, uh, this is uh, Olivier from uh, the business uh, development side of the company and Didier from the IT, who are also uh, in the core team of the project, who are with us in this room and who would be, who would be pleased to answer your question too. So, as I said, I won't go uh, too much in detail uh, how it works. The multi-language capability was very important for us. Another very important thing is that you have to have uh, different access levels because uh, journalists want to keep some files private, but we want to motivate them to share also and to collaborate in small groups or on the company level. The tool uh, uh, wants to improve the information circulation inside the company. So here in this example, the journalist in yellow can access to the puzzle uh, piece A and to the puzzle piece B, but he can't access to the puzzle piece C because uh, uh, the journalist number six doesn't want to share, for example, because he wants to protect his source. You, have, you will always have good reasons not to share. And uh, the information uh, persistence uh, will be better. Basically, journalists collect information over years. And one day they leave, for example, to a competitor. And what do they do? They take the best pieces with them and the rest is distracted. We want with the system that some of these documents remain in the company. So we identified three big uh, use cases. 
big amounts of data coming in at once, in leak situation, journalists who are pouring in uh, data, static data, on a daily basis, and uh, information that is grabbed from uh, targets on the internet on a high uh, frequency. So let me show you some examples. Uh, this is a PDF, uh, it's not OCR, so you just drag and drop it into a FTP uh, file folder, and after a few uh, minutes, you have it in uh, your system and it's searchable. It works also when it's tricky, for example, with colon text or rotated text. Another example, um, we did this story about um, administrative, uh, international administrative tax assistance. Uh, we had 800 documents with um, names uh, of people who were object of those uh, demands, and uh, we extracted the names and the countries with the system within 20 minutes. And to be absolutely sure that the numbers were correct, I checked it with a colleague uh, manually, and it took us six hours. So, uh, next example. When uh, an information is emitted directly from the internet, in most cases, it doesn't come directly to uh, the newsrooms. The news, uh, the news organization get them, for example, from uh, news agencies or from competitors. We want to acquire as fast as possible the information directly from the source. This is the live monitoring example. In Switzerland, we set up uh, uh, all um, police press release feeds. Some are RSS, some are websites, some are coming in through emails. We have 26 cantons, 26 different polices, and also different polices from some cities. It's the same situation than in the, in the US. And what we got is that we had this information in average about 45 minutes before the fastest news website. So you can get an advantage uh, and you can be faster with this. You also can go deeper. Um, for example, you can set up alerts and uh, Every time someone dies in a prison, I get now an email, and I can also search in the past. You have the links to the original. Another task that are uh, quite annoying in newsrooms is the um, uh, web scouting. A normal web scouter can only uh, watch about 20 or 30 websites, and when he arrives at the end, he begins again. With the system, we can do a, a, a scale change. Within one week, we set up more than 150 uh, websites, for example, in the sports domain. Another example is in case of breaking news. Uh, just after the Bastille Day attack uh, in Nice, we uh, acquired uh, the uh, feeds of local uh, medias and also the Twitter account of the mayor there and uh, the press uh, release uh, page of the local police and you, we were able to get this information uh, before instead of waiting and reading the French national press or waiting for the news agencies. So, uh, to summarize, every user has to find its own way to use uh, the system. And for example, in the canton of Bern, there are alerts in case of um, flooding who are only sent by SMS. So we just created a simple, very simple SMS connector to the system for 29.90 uh, with a smartphone and a prepaid card. And this illustrates that you have 
to apply um, playful thinking with this kind of tools, to use them concretely. Our goal is to reach um, 1,000 users after, uh, at the end of 2017. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really, I really want to, to try that, but it's at Tamedia, so I've got to figure out a way to uh, get access, right? So, um, you've started in beta, and you have a very small number of users right now, is that correct? Yeah, we have uh, about 40 uh, user accounts, and we uh, just had some updates, so it's quite annoying. You can't uh, deploy too fast because we are still developing, okay. but um, we hope that we will reach, uh, we will increase quite quickly. So, you know, I don't know about your software in particular, but I, I do know with Overview that uh, I've used it for some time, and one of the issues that I ran across at the Seattle Times was getting reporters to actually use the tool. So I've had, you know, I've had good success where, you know, especially if we were getting a big document dump on a Friday afternoon and we knew what we wanted to search for, you know, I could get adoption with Overview right away and we would find it in 20 minutes and have our story up. But then I've had situations where a reporter will come up with a stack of documents and I'll say, hey, we could scan that and put it in overview. And they're like, oh no, I, I wanna read it. I wanna read it and highlight it and put my post-it notes on it. I mean, they just want that tactile kind of page by page experience. Uh, and it's not a breaking news kind of situation. So how do, for both of you, how do you think you can, uh, I guess, foster adoption? So I definitely underestimated the basics, right? I focused on advanced analysis, but um, journalists love to read and they're very good at it. Paper is very hard to beat. Um, and so, for example, import times, right? If you've got you know, 10,000 pages that need OCR, um, that might be an overnight run to OCR it, but um, you, know, you split it between five reporters and they can read all of them in the same amount of time. Um, or annotation. Uh, you know, I've got photographs of reporters' desks with like these elaborate like highlighting systems and post-it notes and these spreadsheets. Reporters have all of these workflows or filing systems. Um, you know, I thought that people would, you know, I would do the document management, just dump it in there. Um, but no, reporters love to set up like these deep folder hierarchies because that's how they think. And so the next iteration of a tool like this needs to be more like, like Dropbox. It needs to to sync to a folder and use the reporter's laptop as the file repository. And it's just all of these barriers to use that I never imagined. Um, and I think what I missed was that what reporters do is already highly optimized. And so it's not enough to match that. You have to be like, you know, five times better than that. And we're, I think we're just starting to get there. Yes. And um, we think that um, we have to, to coach uh, the people very closely, uh, to train them, to show uh, best practices that work, simple examples that just uh, simplify their lives. Um, for example, if you, you get um, court decisions, uh, you have people who are reading them every morning and you can automate, uh, automate this task and uh, dispatch then uh, the results uh, by interest with keywords. We can go ahead and open it up for questions if there are folks who'd like to come to the microphone. And while we're waiting for, for those folks to, um, to come up, I guess I, I also was very interested in the ability to really go out to the websites and bring back information for the reporters. And I mean, that does seem to make it much less laborious. Is that, I mean, are you getting much interest from folks about that particular piece of it or? I, I think this will be the most uh, most used part uh, of, of of the system because it's you can feel directly the the advantage you get. Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, following on your last question, um, is there something that you can offer reporters that they can't do otherwise that would make them you know want to use your tool? And one thing I was thinking as I was listening to you talk was forensic analysis, like has the document been manipulated or email been edited or something like that. But there may be other things I haven't thought of, so. Yeah, I mean, well, that's why we do this, right? Like we hope that, that there's, there's two goals, right? Do what we do now faster or do things that you could never do before. And in the, you know, could never do it before category, um, 
you know, that, some of the search problems, like that example I showed you where there was this weird paraphrasing about a body lying on the street, like that seems like it should be solvable with computational techniques. And that was 7,000 pages, right? He, he spent his evenings reading uh, meeting minutes for a month. Um, and then there's various types of, of sort of scale problems, like the LAPD crime classification story. That was 400,000 records, and we heard yesterday about this um, uh, doctor sexual abuse thing that um, uh, Jeff did at the Atlanta Journal Constitution, and that was, I think, uh, 300,000 or something. Um, so, uh, sort of scope and, and scale, um, uh, I, I think, are the ways where computers can, can really be a big win here. And then just the sort of advantages of digitization in the first place, you know, knowledge management, which is um, unsexy but incredibly crucial, especially as we start to see these big collaborative projects. Um, journalism is increasingly going transnational because the rest of the world is going transnational. Um, and so these, you know, Panama Papers was 300 people, and I think we're going to see more of that, and you need software to do that. You want to talk to that at all? No, we're good. Yes, that, that, that's why the multilingual uh, capability is so important for me. Uh, you, 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 you don't need to search um, the same word in, in every language. You just, you just search insurance and you get uh, Versicherung and uh, Assurance. Okay. We can go over there. Uh, yeah, I actually want to um, pick up on exactly the scenarios that you were just mentioning in terms of um, thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of documents. Um, and especially looking for um, uh, scenarios or situations that might be referenced obliquely, um, you know, or in kind of covert ways. Reminds me a little bit of uh, uh, the problem of e-discovery. Um, and so I'm curious if you find like a lot of overlap in terms of the tools or in terms of the research. Uh, so this is specifically when, you know, companies sue each other, get, you know, thousands of documents, thousands of emails often, um, and then have, um, uh, like lawyers, um, kind of sorting through, highlighting, and, and uh, trying to uncover, you know, something similar, so parallel to what you were describing in terms of corruption. Yeah. So e-discovery is the is the closest related problem. Um, the reason that uh, journalists have not used e-discovery software by and large is is a couple of reasons. First of all, it's expensive. It's priced for lawyers. Um, one of the reasons journalists have shitty tools is because we can't afford them. Uh, somebody said yesterday, if your business model is selling to newsrooms, you have a problem. Um, <laughs> and it's true. Um, the other problem is that um, every story is basically a one-off, which means there's an incredible amount of custom code that is written. And so the platform has to be incredibly extensible. Um, and um, proprietary tools just aren't built that way. Like, they don't have APIs. They don't, they don't have developer communities. Go ahead. If I may, two questions, one of which might be really easy to go after, which is how do you propose that journalists sort through this kind of surfeit of tools, it seems? Like I've heard about scores of tools that probably have overlapping functionality, maybe glossed over by interoperability, but you know, do you know of a resource that helps people make sense of what to use and what is vetted? And the other question is at what point do you imagine, you know, like Sarah Cohen yesterday said that the way that you encourage reporters to adopt a tool is by integrating it into a story and making clear, yes, how it could make their work faster or unlike what could be done before. Um, how do you, if you have done this, propose that on deadline when a reporter is doing a thing that somebody like me who is an editor facilitate that adoption? Uh, okay, so finding tools. Well, so there's a data journalism community that goes by the, um, the quaint name of, of NICAR. There's a mailing list called uh, NICAR L, and that, that is really where, where all of this conversation happens, for better or worse. Um, I've thought for some time that there should be sort of like a stack overflow for data journalism, but so far, not yet. Um, there's a few projects that have tried to rank tools. Most of them don't haven't really persisted. There's like Reporters Lab at Duke, and there's another one now. Anyway, there's a few places. Um, adoption, so either the tool has to be so seamless that it's like an obvious win, um, which is a lot of work, a lot of 
um, user-centered design work to make something sort of obviously address a pain point. Or they have to have played with it before um, to understand what the capability is. And that's hard in a newsroom because newsrooms are very resource strapped. It's difficult to say, you know what, just go off for a weekend and play, for the, play with this thing. Um, uh, but it, you know, it happens. People go for training and so forth. Perhaps about the second question, how do you convince uh, the reporters? I don't think you have to wait that they come to you with a story because they will be too busy to come to you. Uh, you have to explain them what is possible, make it clear, and this is part of the strategy of the company. And then when they know the possibilities, you have a little chance that they come to you and use your tool. And I can tell you that at the, at the Seattle Times, I, I had a habit of wandering through the newsroom and, and, and looking for <laughs> reporters working on stories. I'm like, what are you working on? And if they had a stack of documents, I'd be like, hey, maybe we could you know, do something that would make this easier for you. And they'd be like, really? Okay. And then I'd show them for that one story. And then, and then their neighbor might see that they're doing something different. I'm like, what are you using? What do you have over there? And then they might adopt it. And the same thing with even, I mean, very basic things like learning how to use a spreadsheet. So go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, because I just wanted to clarify. I mean, one of the things that we do is when somebody is working on something like that, you walk around, you see a big pile of documents with a bunch of stickies, we say, like, have you tried overview? And um, we, we have some firewall issues that we have to work through on parts of overview, but the main part of it works great. And just being able to tag things makes a huge difference. Being able to put stickies on there was like, oh cool, I can count things now, you know, because that's the whole counting issue. Um, I'm curious, one of the things that is happening though is that we've got now maybe five or 10 of these document review systems. Each one has one feature that is just incredible compared to the others. And I, I am curious about how can we bring them together at some point. Um, I know this is a good starting point here, um, but it does seem we're all trying to reinvent the same thing. So I am curious if you have any thoughts on how we could come together on that. I know my company would be interested in that. So I, I think, Jonathan, you did the most uh, in this way. You opened, uh, opened the system with APIs, et cetera. Uh, we are not the owner of the, of, of the, uh, of the software, so uh, we can't decide this. Yeah, I'll also say that um, you know events like this are, are key. Um, there was an event in, in London that um, where Titus and I met actually last year, uh, which I gave the the incredibly droll name of the 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 first conference on knowledge management and investigative journalism, right? Because I I wanted to to like you know make knowledge management sexy again, right? Because this this is the problem. This is this is a really actually very hard and very critical thing, and and um, could benefit from uh, research community attention. Um, it's hard, it's a difficult problem and it, it turns out to be the, the key problem. And um, it would be nice if we could build on each other's work instead of endlessly replicating pieces of it. And you know, I, I like Overview, I think it's a nice system, but I'm not, um, uh, my, my goal is, is broader than that, right? If, if you have a, a really nice, system that you think can evolve into an open source platform that we can all work with, great. But um, we're going to have to start deciding um, to get out of this hole. Yeah. So around uh, NLP researchers, you may be right that uh, people don't really want to look at that stuff. But I, I think you should be a little more optimistic because certainly in data science and the database community at this point, there's a very clear realization that 80% of what data scientists are spending their time on at a minimum is all the kind of work that you were talking about that everybody thought was very mundane and not worth thinking about as a technical challenge and now realize that it's a huge technical challenge. So I think tools will be coming um, over time, partly just because of all the requirements from these other areas. I hope so. Okay, I think that will be our last question. Thank you very much. <laughs>